So if you're watching this video, my assumption is that you've seen the first two videos that I did for this unit. It's important that you review those or make sure you've seen those before you move on to this one. Looking at concavity today, and we're going to understand what that is, how we can determine where it is on a function. And we only use the second derivative not only to find concavity, but also to determine the nature of critical points. We did that in the critical points video, but I did mention then that as an alternative to using the first derivative, you can actually use a second derivative to determine the nature of critical points. Second derivative we've talked about before, that's just the rate of change of the rate of change. We use that when we're looking at acceleration earlier on. And all you have to do is just take the derivative of the first derivative. That's what your second derivative is. It will tell you if the slopes of the tangent are either increasing or decreasing. So let's start by looking at concave upward. If you see this graph that I have on the screen, you notice that it looks like a upward parabola, a parabola that opens up. Okay, well, let's put some tangent lines on it to illustrate the first point. These two lines, these two blue lines, represent tangent lines. And as it says here, the curve is above those tangent lines. So the tangent lines are below the curve. It's shaped like a valley. We mentioned that. The slopes are increasing. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to show you what that means by way of a graph, a parabola. If you see that parabola in the picture below there, that parabola has a tangent line. Watch what happens when I start the animation of how that tangent line is changing as it moves along. It's going to do a bit of a rotation. And that rotation is actually a counterclockwise rotation as it moves from left to right. Anytime the tangent line is increasing, which is what this line is showing you, that means that your tangent lines are actually rotating in a counterclockwise direction as this was. So if the slopes are increasing, then it means that your first derivative, which is a measure of slope, is also increasing. That's what these upward arrows mean. The rate of change of the slope, they're talking about the second derivative now, that's going to be positive. And the last line is saying the same thing, that the second derivative is positive. Concave downward. Well, the opposite is true for the tangent lines. My tangent lines are now all above the function or the curve is it below the tangent lines. Either way, I want to look at it. The slopes of these lines are now going to be following a decreasing pattern. Look at the diagram again at the bottom of the page. I want you to follow that line as it moves, that tangent line as it moves along the surface of the curve. You'll notice that this time it's rotating in a clockwise direction. And that means that your slopes are actually decreasing. It started off being positive, it flattened out, then it went negative. That must mean that it's decreasing. So if the slopes are decreasing, then the first derivative is also going to be decreasing because that's what a measure of slope is, the first derivative. The rate of change of the slope is negative because you're going down and you're Second derivative, therefore, is also negative. And as it says here, the curve is shaped like a hill. Let's also talk about point of inflection. If we're talking about concave up and concave down, it may be that a curve has both on it. And there's a point where there is a change of concavity. Well, look at this particular curve here. There is a section here which appears to be concave down and a section over here which is concave up. And there's a point at which there's a change. And that point seems to be right here. We're going to call that thing a point of inflection. The same thing on this curve. This one looks like a curve that has a concave down section here and a concave up section here. There's a point of inflection on both of them. So watch what happens with my diagram. That diagram there is a, is a, is a picture of a cosine curve or a, or, or a sinusoidal curve. There's a section that's concave down and a section that's concave up. Watch what happens to this tangent as you move along the curve. The tangent is rotating in a clockwise. That means it's concave down. Then it changes and goes into a counterclockwise rotation. which means it's concave up. And that junction between both of them, this point right here, is what we're going to call our point of inflection. We're going to do the same thing again with the second curve. This one is going to have another point of inflection. I'm going to be rotating that tangent line again. 
you notice that the tangent is rotating it clockwise that means and it just changed a while ago so I'm moving from a concave down to a concave up and again what that means is that I have this point of inflection right here where the junction point is between the concave up and the concave down so in general we should understand that if the second root is positive on an interval then that graph is going to be referred to as concave up the whole section of the second derivative is positive that section is concave up the second derivative being negative means that that section of the graph is concave down and if the second derivative is equal to zero then it's likely to be a point of inflection but later on we're going to talk some more about what happens when that second derivative is equal to zero point of inflection truth is that a point of inflection can also occur when the second derivative does not exist remember graphs that look like this right that have that vertical tangent which we've looked at which means that it is not you can't derive it at this point here does that mean that there is no point of inflection well there is if you look at the graph you can see that there is so we have to also conclude that point of inflection could exist when the second derivative is zero or the second derivative does not exist so the second derivative here would not exist but that still doesn't mean there is no point of inflection there is a point of inflection so we have to look for that as a possibility to figure out where the the, the point of inflection is we're going to create second derivative tables and then we're going to use those to determine our intervals of concavity where is it concave up where is it concave down in this case this section right here this section right here would be concave up and this section over here would be concave down so there is a change in concavity right here there's a point of inflection right here but that second derivative would not be equal to zero would not exist at that point all right look at problem a and we're not talking specifically about concave up or concave down really we're just talking about what that second derivative is telling us this second derivative if you took the first derivative was 6x plus 3 and the second derivative is positive it's 6 so it does mean that this entire function is concave up having a positive second derivative my slopes are always increasing think about the diagram that I had before for the parabola where it was rotating in this counterclockwise manner so it was moving this way right that's what the the rotation would look like in this case it means that not only do I know that the slopes are increasing but that the whole curve is concave up that's really what it should be telling us in a case where and you can see that on the graphic right now it's rotating in that counterclockwise manner now in this case we're looking at a linear function we know from a linear this is 3x plus 1 x2 by the way you know for a linear function we know that the slope is really the same no matter where you are so when we take the first derivative we're going to get what that slope is which is 3 but when we take the second derivative we're going to get 0 which means that there is no change in that slope right that slope is neither increasing nor decreasing so it's a constant rate of change and that's what happens when you have a straight line how about this one now we're looking for a specific part of this function which is concave up this is a quintic function right degree 5 function so we're going to go through the steps of taking the first derivative which you can confirm for yourself should be this we're going to take our second derivative which you can confirm should be that and then we're going to set this second derivative to zero I'm going to factor that factor it some more and from this we can see that we have two values of x that make the second derivative equal to zero we're going to set up a table now well let me first of all show what the graph looks like so on this graph if I just animate this you'll see that it tends to do that clockwise rotation and all of a sudden it changes and does a counterclockwise rotation which suggests that it does have a concave up section which is what we're trying to find it also suggests that we have a point of inflection because there was a change in that concavity but let's move from that now and set up a table with the values that made this second derivative equal to zero here's my table I'm going to use a zero and a minus two so I'm going to go from minus infinity to minus two from minus two to zero and from zero to infinity pick points that are in each of these sections as I've done 
and then I can establish where it is positive and where it's negative. You can take a minute to look at the table and sort of follow my method here. I split up the factors on the side and I've also plugged in those points into each of the factors and then you realize of course that the x plus 2 squared is always going to be positive but it depends on the value of x as to whether the product is positive or negative. Turns out that the minus infinity to minus 2 section is negative for the second derivative so it means it's concave down. It's negative from minus 2 to 0 so that's still concave down but it's positive from 0 to infinity so that means that that section is actually concave up and that's what we're being asked. But I'm going to answer a different question as well. So we've answered the question that the question that, that was asked, but let's also look at the fact that it, there was a change from concave down to concave up. So if you just look at the diagram for a second, this whole section here seemed to be concave up, concave up here and concave up here as well. Sorry, concave up for this whole section here. But it looked like there was a change when you went from here to here. So as you can see from the result, it does say concave down up to zero, and then after zero is concave up. That would mean, or that would suggest, that I have a point of inflection at the junction between these two, which is at zero, two. So at this point right here, let me just sort of put that little thing on the diagram. This point right here is where I had the change of concavity. And that's why the point of inflection is at zero, two. Let's try this on a rational function. You can confirm for yourself that the first derivative looks like that, and my second derivative looks like this. I'm expecting you to be able to do that on your own. Now, look at that second derivative. This second derivative has no solution if I set that equal to zero. Right? If I set this equal to zero, I cannot get this rational equation to be zero. So. Is there no point of inflection? Is there no concave up? No, we're going to have to look at when this does not exist. This second root does not exist. It doesn't exist at minus 7 over 4. So we're going to set up our table with that as the intervals. So minus infinity to minus 7 over 4, and then minus 7 over 4 to infinity. Put values in that make sense, and then determine whether the function is concave up or down. The top of the function is always negative, so we have to look at what happens to the bottom of the function. If I put minus 2 into that, it's going to become positive. That means it's concave up. If I put 0 into that, it's going to be negative, so it's concave down. So to answer the question, the concave up section of this graph is actually from minus infinity to minus 7 over 4. Now, is there a change in concavity? Well, there kind of looks like there is, but the fact is that there's no point of inflection because at minus 7 over 4, there's a vertical asymptote, so it does not exist. The function doesn't exist at that point. And here's a graph just to illustrate that. You can see that there is a concave up section over here. That whole section is concave up all the way to minus infinity. And this section over here is concave down. The question asks us for where it was concave up. So obviously it is the first part here, which is minus infinity to minus 7 over 4. Second derivative test. Well, we talked about the second derivative test in relation to concavity. You can also use a second derivative test to determine the nature of critical points. Meaning, is it a max, is it a min, or is it something else? Well, here's what the test says. If the critical point that you've determined from the first derivative is in a section of the graph or you put that into the second derivative and it's positive then that critical point is actually a minimum right you can look at the top of this to understand why that is if there's a critical point in an interval where the graph is concave up then it must be a local minimum right here All right conversely if the critical point that you have chosen is in an interval where the graph is concave down, it must be a local maximum right here. So we're going to use this second derivative test. And by the way, the third part of this test that says that if the critical point that you put in is equal to zero, the test fails, we have to use the first derivative test. What do I mean by that? When we use the first derivative test, we tested the critical point just before and after and use the slopes to determine whether it was a max or a min. If you go back to look at that critical points 
video, you should be able to confirm what that test is to determine the nature of the critical point. Let's use that on this or these two functions. First one is a cubic function. And I'm going to go ahead and find the first derivative. Now I need that first derivative to tell what the critical points are. So let's find the critical numbers first. Critical numbers comes from setting this first derivative equal to zero. So my factored form looks like that. And I have critical numbers at zero and minus three. That's what those two critical numbers are. And I'm going to now take those critical numbers and put them into the second derivative. Here's my second derivative. Putting the zero into that gives me a positive. And that means that the curve is concave up. And that means that this point is a minimum. So just follow through. If you look, go back to the previous slide, we talked about a section of the curve that was concave up. If there is a critical point in that section, we said it was a minimum. And that's exactly what this is. There is a critical point in a section of the curve, which is positive. It must be a minimum. When x is minus 3, on the other hand, the y prime is the y double prime. That's the second derivative is negative, And that means the curve is concave down. So minus 3, 9 must be a maximum. Over here, if I were to take this function and find its derivative, it looks like that. Set it equal to 0, just like the first one. And find my critical numbers. What makes this thing equal to 0? Focus on the numerator. x squared minus 1 equals 0 means that the critical numbers occur at plus and minus 1. Which means that I'm going to take those two numbers and put them into my second derivative. Here's my second derivative. You can confirm that for yourself. I'm going to sub in these critical numbers plus and minus 1 into my second derivative. When I put in minus 1, the second derivative is negative, and that means the curve is concave down. When I put, and that means that it's a max, by the way, minus 1, minus 2. By the way, how do I get the minus 2? Plugging in that minus 1 back into the original function up here. When I plug in positive 1, I get a positive. That means that the curve is concave up, and that must mean that this 1, 2 is a minimum. All right, so there are your success criteria. Hopefully that helps you.